Welcome everyone. My name is Walter Brennan. I'm with EXP and welcome to the TEA's theme park design series. Uh, before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items for all of you. Uh, number one, this event is being recorded, so you have been warned. Number two, we suggest using the speaker view uh, display option in Zoom to optimize your viewing experience today. And then uh, number three, uh, please use the chat window to ask your questions as we go along and we will answer those at the end. Okay, on with the show. The purpose of this series is to shine a spotlight on various disciplines within the theme entertainment industry. The intent is to allow students and TEA members a chance to learn more about a discipline that may be uh, not as well known or understood. We're gonna pull back the curtain a little bit and help you see some of the magic behind the scenes. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the second in our series of events. Uh, the first one was landscape architecture, which by the way, is available on the TEA's YouTube channel. And after landscape architecture, it made the most sense to me to roll into the discipline of architecture. So as the master architect, or excuse me, the master designer, if you will, uh, the architect is responsible for everything related to a, uh, uh, an attractions building. Uh, when I say everything, I mean everything. I mean everything in the building, everything on the building, uh, for all the consultants that are designing something for that building. Uh, and as the master designers today, uh, I am pleased to present Coffee Polk and Andy Fassman from Cunningham. And they will introduce themselves and tell us everything we need to know about architecture in the themed entertainment industry. So take it away, Andy. All right. Um... Hello, everybody. My name is Andy Fastman, as Walter indicated. Um, <clears throat> I um, have been doing architecture for more years than I want to admit to, uh, themed architecture for the vast majority of that. Um, I've got a whole list of uh, projects and accomplishments, etc. But I think I always like to open with a little story of why I do this, which is way more important than what I've done in the past. You guys can read that. Um, when I fell into themed architecture, and I really kind of uh, got voluntold to go uh, be a staff extension at Imagineering a uh, long time ago, and, you know, toiled on a project and went through all the tribulations and learned all the ropes. And when it was all said and done, I was doing a final punch walk on the ride platform and the ceremonious or ceremonial first guests were coming up the stairs and it was, I think the, it, it was a family with two parents and a boy and a girl and it was the little girl that got me. Um, just the smile that went, you know, from temple to temple, it was such a big smile. And I said, Ooh, I had something to do with that. And been doing it ever since. Um, that's my intro. <laughs> nice and easy. Coffee, go for it. Hi, I'm Coffee Polk. Um, I've been doing architecture for at Cunningham for about 14 years. Um, before I got to Cunningham, I was in Los Angeles at a handful of firms. And before I was in architecture, I did film and television gigs. So I have blown stuff up. I have the props. I have designed sets, and then I got tired of finding a new job every three months, so I transferred all those skills into architecture, and so it was a really good fit for what we call big name entertainment, which is the world of themed architecture at Cunningham, and so, you know, theme parks are primarily one of my jams. Uh, casinos and other things are my other jams, but um, if it's got a story to it, and every building does, the more I can tell that story through what I design and detail, the happier I am. So with that said, we'll just get on with it. 
Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? Quite simply, we are going to discuss what is themed architecture. Obviously, well, maybe not obviously, uh, we're going to probably compare and contrast that to non-themed architecture. Uh, once we get into the understanding of what we're talking about, uh, we're going to look at some specific aspects of the themed architectural project. Uh, we're going to touch on queue design, which is how one approaches the building um, and you know waits for the experience to happen and uh, how that is accommodated. We're going to speak about facade design, which you know clearly to get you into that story that Coffee mentioned, not too many spoilers. Um, I think we need to use uh, a lot more and different techniques than a typical project would. Uh, we're going to look at some more technical aspects like fire life safety, uh, things like occupancy, egress, sprinklers. We're going to look at accessibility, uh, ramps, stairs, restrooms, uh, equal and um, uh, fair accommodation. Uh, experiences that are the same across all different um, access levels. And then we're going to round it out with uh, the design phases and project delivery and finish it off with a look at the tools that we use and how we use them, which would be Revit and how we coordinate, uh, coming back to that idea that Walter mentioned of uh, the master builder, um, how we use our tools to get everybody's work to come together harmoniously. All right, so we're gonna start with what the heck is architecture? Well, you know, it's the design technique of designing a building. It's different than building a building, but you can't really build a building without some level of architecture, whether it's formal architecture, like that goes through architects or you know, owner as builder, they're still doing some level of architecture, although you know, most state courts would argue, you can, they can't call themselves an architect. Um, but still, the, it, it's the same activity, but because they're building their own, they're endangering themselves and not the public. So that's where the difference lies. Um, so when you go into architecture, or if you're in architecture, or interested in architecture, you know, you're looking at that art and technique of designing. What makes the building the building outside of, you know, the studs, the drywall, uh, and all of the rest of its guts? Like, where does that design actually happen? Next slide, please. The architect is the master builder, um, which, you know, this theory has been around since the dawn of building and architecture as a career. But what does it mean in modern times? You know, we don't need to draw three sheets of paper and suddenly, you know, people are up pouring stone for a cathedral. Um, it doesn't happen that way. What happens is that, next slide, please. Kersha, there we go. Come on, Andy. <laughs> I got it, I got it. <laughs> so, you know, we are, in addition to the designers, we are the coordinators of disciplines. So every discipline has essentially a Lego block of a different color. And what architects do is we don't tell them necessarily where their Lego goes, but how it needs to interface with the rest of the building blocks. Um, so, you know, if MEP is yellow, we need to make sure that when it crashes into green of structure, it crashes appropriately and not, you know, doesn't cause a problem for either discipline. We do that for all of the disciplines, whether it's, you know, lighting, fire life safety, graphics, interior specifications, you know, and it, you know, it goes down even as far as getting the intellectual property that drives the actual show to work with all of the rest of it. So they give us their intent. We execute that intent through all of the rest of the disciplines, make sure everybody's coordinated, everybody gets it, and nobody's pulling you out of that world. Next slide, please. We're also responsible for essentially the housekeeping bits. 
So the scheduling of the project deliverables, making sure everybody gets whatever they need in time to do whatever their part is, um, making sure those deliverables are delivered in a timely fashion and organized and the index looks all right and you know the graphics all work. And that can be a set of sheets or it could be a 3D model in some cases, authorities having jurisdiction, the AHJ, you hear this a lot. Um, they are starting to take 3D Revit models uh, in lieu of paper, which is pretty exciting and also terrifying at the same time. You have to model to a higher level if they're going to take a 3D model to check for health, safety, and welfare, which is the primary responsibility of an architect. It's not the pretty design, it's not the, the, you know, the fun stuff necessarily. Our first and foremost responsibility is health, safety, and welfare. So, you know, when that, and that rolls into plan check, code compliance, accessibility compliance, construction admin, um, you know, making sure that what we've specified is actually what the contractor is putting into the building. Uh, and then, you know, we're also responsible for checking out contractor pay applications to make sure that the percentage of work they say they've done matches what they want to get paid for, matches what's actually in the field. So there's a third and there's, there's more. And if you're in architecture, you will learn all of this as you study for your AREs. We're not gonna cover it now. All right, so, so let's jump into themed architecture. Um, let's go back a little bit to the what is architecture question. Of course, we are all familiar with the quotidian typologies, houses, schools, municipal buildings, tall, short, wide, deep. Um, disclaimer, I wrote a whole bunch of big words in here. I promise we'll get to them all by the end or ask questions. Um, there are numerous styles of architecture and there are numerous approaches. Uh, in front of you, you have examples of several diff different buildings where architects took very uh, complex geometrical and formal approaches. However, merely having complex geometry does not a themed environment make. So the difference between regular architecture, architecture with a big A and themed architecture with a big T is essentially the addition of story. While every building tells a story, it's usually the design story of that building. What themed architecture does is tell a narrative story that the occupants somehow become part of. What we're trying to do through this architecture is reflect that storytelling enough to create a suspension of disbelief in the guest or the staff or the passerby, whoever is actually experiencing the space, dragging you out of one reality and putting you into another one through the architecture of the building. Next slide. So you can see that like the difference between a regular bus stop in your everyday world and a ride platform loading station. Like the ride platform loading station is actively putting you into the world of that ride. Whereas your bus station is just a place to wait for the bus. You're not being transported to a new and different reality. Next slide. Again, when we do the same thing with quick serve restaurants and theme parks, you have on the left, the standard kind of run of the mill. You can find it anywhere from Peoria to Pittsburgh kind of quick serve restaurant. And the one on the right, you might recognize this animated uh, environment from your television set. Um, you know, so our job is to take that very familiar animated bar and make it a reality. You know, how we do that through the use of materials, space, um, paint, uh, graphics, furniture and finishings, lighting, and that's all part of what a themed environment is. You know, it, there's very much attention paid to what something looks like. Does it look round and bubbly like a cartoon or is it angular and kind of angry like, I don't know, some sort of steampunk monster thing that would be all spiky and weird. 
how are the textures bringing you into those different worlds? How does the color, how does the lighting, you know, it goes even down to the, the audio, where is it coming from? Does it look like, does it come from something that looks like a television set? Or is it something more atmospheric, like creaking chains that you're not sure where they're coming from? How does that all contribute to immersing you in this storied environment? A really good example of this is um, the train uh, Hogwarts Express in Florida, which takes you between two parks. Um, from the inside of the train, the show has put together this fabulous video sequence. So you feel like you're going from one place to another in that Harry Potter world. Um, the stations are tricked out so that you are still in that Harry Potter world. But if you are in the back of house, you know, employee parking lot, you can see in the bottom picture, you're not really in that world. You're going over some garages and some utility sheds and bus parking. Um, but you would never know that from the inside of the train where they've decided to keep you in that environment and leave you there so that your suspension of belief, belief sorry, suspension of disbelief between the two parks is maintained. So that's how show starts to do it. And then show gives us all the ideas. We take them and make them real in the architecture. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's now turn to Q design. We're going to start by looking at the queuing sequence, which is where the guests approach an attraction, a ride, a show, or even in some cases, a food service venue. Um, if you've ever been to a theme park, uh, there are many different experiences, even while waiting for food, where um, you have an engaging wait rather than just standing in a line looking at the back of someone's head in front of you. Uh, the story truly starts to unfold here. The queue allows for the setup of the experience that the guest is about to have. Some of you might recognize this queue sequence that you see on the screen in front of you. Uh, it opened up right before the COVID shutdown, or shortly before. Um, but more importantly, this diagrammatic view illustrates the different disbursements of guests into the attraction. Uh, via the attraction entry, guests are sorted into a single rider queue, which is this purple one, a fast pass, which is an accelerated path through, which is usually a premium paid uh, fast pass, uh, has many names in many different parks, but it's always the express way to go. Uh, and then your typical standard standby queue, which is the name for regular queue, where most of the guests go. Um, while all of the guests eventually do get to the experience within the ride, how they approach it shapes the story. Each lane representing a slightly different storytelling arc from entry through ride, and then all the way out to the exit. Again, in this example, purple is representing single rider, where the guests experience the shortest time between entering and riding, but they do miss the majority of the show. The blue line is the fast pass, which allows guests to arrive at a designated time and skip some portions of the story to get to the ride quicker. The green line is the standby lane, which can last upward of 90 minutes. The maximum amount of story and engagement are necessary to fill that time. Now let's walk through a few of the scenes in this sequence so that you can get a sense of how the story unfolds. Scene one is the entry tower. As you approach this, sorry, as you approach, this is where the story starts to present itself. To the right is a large prop nestled into the building. 
You do not discover this view until you come around the corner and are confronted with it. This employs an approach and discovery method to lure in the guests without revealing everything all at once. As you walk toward the entry tower, you see there are uh, you see the three wait time signs for the different queues, and you come across a reception booth where attendants will help direct guests into the building. This is where the guest paths start to diverge and the story they get to see unfold begins to change. So scenes two and three are the hangar bay. Um, in this hangar bay, there are layers upon layers of detail if you spent the time to look around. The engine in the middle is being worked on and occasionally it moves and exhausts some steam. If you know where to look, you can also see the remnants of a game gone wrong with blaster marks in the walls, uh, droids and engine parts from the movie upon which this is based, and crates that are open uh, and show that some creatures have escaped. But to see all the stories that, to see all in these stories, you have to be in the standby queue as shown on the left and the top right. If you choose the fast pass, which is the bottom right image, you will get a glance into this room, but you do not experience the same rich level of detail and duration of immersion. You're just passing through. The single rider queue is, well, painted gypsum board and a couple pieces of GAC on the wall. GAC is a very important technical term in the themed world. Really have to remember that one. Uh, this portion of the queue is very much in theme with the rest of the attraction, but the storytelling is limited to overhead speakers that make announcements about what is happening elsewhere in the building. But to be fair, most of these people are looking at their phones anyway. Hey, I just want to jump in and actually define GAC. Um, GAC is pretty much anything that is not truly functional for the building to stand up, that adds to the story, that is nailed to a wall or glued to a ceiling. Um, like in this picture, you know, most of the hoses that aren't actually serving an HVAC function are GAC. Um, so GAC can be signage, GAC can be fake droids, GAC can be all sorts of random bits and pieces that add to the story, but don't serve the actual building itself. If you strip it all out, the building would still be a building, it would still be waterproof. It's spelled G-A-K. <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and it, it, you could repurpose the building. If you stripped all the GAC out, you would still have a functional building. It would still be specialized because you have ride stuff, which is different than GAC, but it would still be a waterproof, safe building. Yes. Um, OK, so moving on to scenes four and five, uh, this is called The Overlook. Uh, the Overlook has windows that look down upon the prop in the courtyard. Uh, below you is a computer floor, and under the temporary stanchions is a metal panel that raises in some portions to unveil a computer system. This is all part of the show and part of the story unfolding. That computer system is connected to multiple cabling, uh, multiple cables running above that actually house our lights and our sprinkler heads. So we're using some of the GAC, as Coffee just defined for you, to actually hide some of the functional elements of the building. The blast shields that appear at the top of the windows are specifically placed to hide the rest of the park while aiming your view to the story that we want you to see. The hunk of, the hunk of junk, well written, Andy, below, and scripted views of the land beyond. 
Again, only the standby guests get the meandering walk next to the windows, while the fast pass guest takes a straight shot behind all of this into the pre-show hold. Now that we mentioned the pre-show hold, um, this is the last area of queue before the pre-show, which furthers the story of a working facility with the hydraulic lift in the middle and the monitors on the wall showing maps and galaxies. In reality, this is where the cast members divide the guests into the A and B side of the building for loading. This is the main storytelling aspect of the attraction and truly sets up the story for the ride that you're about to enjoy. And when I say this, I mean the pre-show experience proper. At this point, the fast pass and standby guests are merged. And from here on out, they get the same story for the rest of the sequence. Meanwhile, the single, single rider guests are standing on the stairs waiting to be one of the chosen ones to go with the next group. On the monitors, the guests see a ship that they will experience landing in the hangar bay and getting ready for them to board. Uh, scenes 10 through 18 are the final wait and the ride itself. Uh, this, uh, this area is for some, uh, you know, holy ground, uh, especially to the huge fans of this movie franchise. Uh, it has been said that people come into this area and cry. They snap pictures. Uh, they reenact scenes from, uh, you know, made famous from the films. Yeah. It is meticulously detailed to match the set photos to ensure that movie canon was indeed followed. It is incredible how many guests will stand here, take out their phone and Google stills from the films or even videos from the film and compare and contrast the details. Uh, the ride vehicle itself, um, this is it. It is the greatest cockpit ever made. Uh, there are within this space over 200 flashing lights, buttons. You can press and touch all of them. It is meant to be the cockpit of the flight freighter, most famously used by the main character and smugglers during the Galactic Civil War. This is where one of the characters perhaps made an infamous run that is referred to throughout the entire film series. Um, more importantly, the guests mm -hmm. get to pilot the ship. I don't know why. And they are able to <coughs> reenact scenes from the movies themselves. Okay, now after we have finished the ride experience itself, we then move into the exit sequence. Um, because the exit of this attraction is a very long walk, especially depending on which of the side A or side B of the building you're exiting, the storytelling had to continue uh, through the exit path as well. In fact, the exits became three additional storytelling opportunities. Uh, in this scene, the exit pathways lead you past the storage units. This is where the guest enters back into the self space storage portion of the building via the stairs. Um, Every light fixture, speaker, and HVAC grill are placed precisely to stay within the story. Again, because the exit is so protracted here, the designers had the opportunity to turn the exit into um, in, into multiple storytelling opportunities. Uh, this scene that you're seeing now um, is representing a storage unit with the side blown out so that, the, so that the smugglers could escape from the authorities while smuggling goods. The facility utilizes metal panels 
and has to mimic the explosion uh, through the concrete with epoxy and sculpting to replicate the laser cuts. Um, the final sequence takes you through the carved out tunnels. Uh, these are done with carved plaster to, rep to represent uh, the smuggling escape routes used by, um, by the occupants of this space. Uh, the scene was reminiscent of the ice base from another one of the films in the series. Um, because of the way that the ice was cut was never explained in the films, the designers actually came up with a machine in their minds uh, that could make this type of cut through the rock. And then that enabled them to kind of further the idea a little bit past what was in the films proper. And then in the final exiting scene, as you leave the building, um, there is a partially collapsed portion of the tunnel from a blast, um, which actually was a structural brace that couldn't have anything attached to it. That would be this guy right here. So it just became a part of the story. Improvisation is part and parcel of what we do as architects. So when you were staring at that cue, did you notice the life safety methods and, and beans that we had in there? I mean, some of the stuff we can't hide, we're not allowed to, but it has to be in there. But if we tell a good enough story, you're not gonna notice things like exit signs and Wi-Fi repeaters and fire strobes and fire extinguishers and trash cans. I mean, that's part of what we do as um, architects of themed architecture is how can we make the story real enough, immersive enough, distracting enough that you're not gonna notice the code required exit signs, you know, at, um, at seven, you know, at the height and off of the floor. Um, how are you not going to notice, how can we make it so you don't notice the, the staff that has to come around, you know, various sneaky ways to empty the trash cans? How can we embed water fountains so they look like they're part of the story and not just some plant on modern thing that destroys the illusion? Next slide. So we're going back to cue design for the diagrams. And you know, we're talking about like the cue path. We have metrics for all of this. How long people have to wait for X number of feet and then you know where we need to put the water fountains and where we need to put the fire extinguishers and how far between queue line breaks we have to have so that you can get from you know this wiggly bit that goes back and forth you know where we break that so that you can actually get to an exit um, they're all metrics that we look at very carefully with the show team because they need to understand that we have to get out of the building and we have to maintain that show illusion. So it's a very delicate back and forth, a lot of back and forth, like forever back and forth with the show team to get everybody to understand that, you know, health, safety, and welfare comes first, then code, uh, and then, you know, anything else the AHJ has decided has to happen because in different jurisdictions, there are different requirements, then ADA, uh, and and then then show, so show is kind of at the bottom of the requirements, but has the most importance for what the building is actually going to do for the guest experience. Mm -hmm. Next slide. This is a dark ride. So a dark ride is one of those rides where you don't actually go anywhere in the ride. You get into a little pod. There are screens, and the screens just fling things at you, and they shake, and you pretend like you're moving. Um, so, you know, for, for us as architects, that's pretty good. You, you make a box, they put all the dark ride, you know, ride vehicles on a plinth. It has some engineering and make it shake and rumble and acoustic stuff happening. But, you know, as far as coordinating with ride, that's one of the easier ones. It's the ones that actually have tracks that move in three dimensions and up and down like um, 
the Harry Potter ride, if you've been on it, it's on a Kuka, which is like a big thing with legs on a track and then it has the ride vehicle on the top and it can do this. <laughs> and that's a little trickier because, you know, those ride vehicles have safety envelopes. So not only do we have to figure out how to make the track go around and, and you know, with the ride people, it's how do you keep all of the story bits outside of that safety envelope of the ride, which, you know, is pretty large because the safety envelope is, is any place that that ride can lean to plus X number of feet, depending on the ride vehicle. So um, for this one, you've seen these diagrams earlier in the slide, the standard queue, a single rider overflow on express, and we explained what all of those do. And you can see this particular ride box has an A side and a B side also, but you don't split out until you get very close to the end of the queue. Next. Facade design. Andy's going to run you through some facade design. Yes, we are. Um, while queuing, experience, and exiting sequence, take a hard look at the path through the building and the surrounding spaces. Let's move on to the envelope of the building itself. As previously mentioned, the building envelope must contain the guts of the building, keep the weather out, and keep the conditioned air in. I think we just made Walter happy. It must provide a barrier between the outside environment and the interior elements. In addition to the usual requirements of a facade, themed facades must also reflect the story. See, it always comes back to the story. Picking up the character of the IP, which is intellectual property, uh, that could be a film, that could be a character, that could be any number of uh, different uh, book, you know, uh, uh, but it's the intellectual property that is the theme itself. Uh, durability is a factor also as many more people will pass by, look at, and touch these facades far more than in a usual building setting. Also, the character must be created to the whim of an art director within a hair of tolerance. Um, a very common note that you may or may not be able to read as we go through the next set of slides uh, says, final art direction in the field, final dimension to be verified in field by art director, final carving pattern to be determined in the field by art director. This is to allow the individual art director the freedom to make it perfect in the field rather than something being designed one way and as certain parameters may change or as you know it's built and we see it in the real sunlight, it allows adjustments to be made to get the absolute most um, accurate replication of the IP that we can. Uh, to accomplish this, much of the facade is created with carved cement plaster. This product is akin to the finish you see on many buildings, and it is colloquial, colloquially referred to as stucco. As an aside, Stucco is a trade name of a specific product produced by the La Havre Stucco Company, much like Kleenex is a very specific type of facial tissue. Uh, carved cement plaster is similar to the flat troweled or knockdown textured versions that everyone recognizes, but it can be applied in thicker and more robust layers and carved to represent a multitude of building materials such as wood, stone, siding, masonry, you name it. Cement plaster can be as whatever. In addition, there are show windows, which have set pieces inside of them, rather than being the practical windows that you would expect where a guest sees into the actual building space inside. There are light boxes, gags, and show action equipment as well. Um, in addition, we have many um, atypical, let's call them quantities of lighting and signage, far more than on a usual typical building. 
let's take a look at a facade now from intent through detailing. So if you look at the bottom image here, the bottom image was the creative intent at the inception of the project that was handed off from a uh, scenic designer. At the top of the page, you can see the same elevation. At this point though, it has been developed into a buildable form. And I believe this one comes from somewhere late in the DD or early in the CD phase. So very close to being ready to be constructed. If we were to look at the building in a 3D axonometric projection, uh, we can see that we are looking at that facade that we showed on the page before was what's pictured here in the red box. So now let's zoom in on just the portion that we're going to develop here. So from street level up, you can see that this has been drawn meticulously. It has been detailed. And in addition to that, um, partially through the beauty of using a 3D-based building information modeling software such as Revit, uh, we are able to cut many sections through this. Now, where one would typically think of a section as these vertical cuts through the building where you can look in and left and right and see what you would see had you been, you know, slice that building with a laser sword, um, we can also take what's called a plan cut, which is start here and cut across and then look down. And what you end up with is your level one low floor plan. If you look at the marks further up against, uh, further up on the facade, we take many of these plan cuts. Mm -hmm. Basically, we take one at any given instance that there's enough of a change in the articulation of the facade that we're going to want to look at some aspect of a poster or a recessed window system uh, or the marquee that you had just seen previously. We I do want to, I do, I want to point out one thing. Sure. So on these facades, like often the waterproofing layer is further back than the facade layer. So oh, I was you know, buried in weed. We'll get there. That, hang on, is your building envelope. And then in front of that is essentially GAC. Um, yes. It is a structural facade, but it's not necessary to make the building function. It is there strictly for show and to immerse you in that imaginary world that we keep trying to drag you out of the real one and into whatever this themed environment is from the outside to the inside to the exit sequence to the ride and back out. Yeah and if we look at the same building in section uh, you can begin to see exactly what Coffee was pointing out which is while we have a facade an actual facade here all of this ghosted information is plant on in front of the actual building facade. Um, if we're then to take that building facade and enlarge it up a scale, um, in this case, one to 50, which is, uh, we're looking at about a quarter inch to a foot scale here, we can then start to study things in terms of a wall section. And within that wall section, you can see the actual envelope of the building that contains the conditioned air and where the insulation goes and where the waterproofing is, starts back here at the door, cantilevers out over toward the marquee, and then comes straight up the wall back here, terminates at the roof, and so your waterproof enclosure is actually just this portion of the building. Now look at how much detail is outside of that waterproof membrane and outside of that uh, sealed envelope. 
all of that is at the service of creating the story for us. Um, here's another example of uh, a similar similar set of wall sections just cut at a uh, slightly deeper part in the facade where there's not as much articulation up front, up top here. Now, if you notice that facade had several windows across the entirety of it, so we will have what we call a window legend. Within this window legend is every window that exists in the building. Uh, in this case, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. One would think I would have counted that and made a note ahead of time. Not so much. Um, what's important though, is as you zoom in on any single window, is that every last meticulous detail of that window has been dimensioned. It has been annotated. And even to the extent of, if you look at this line here, which then steps back out. And we have a similar indicator over here. Uh, these profiles are also indicating where this window is within the wall. And if you look at a more traditional section down at the bottom, you can see that these windows are inset exceptionally deep into the wall cavity. Now that we know what our window looks like, we can detail our head, jam and sill conditions of the window. So the window that we were just looking at happens to be details number six and seven right here. And those are windows where, again, just to reiterate the point, our cement plaster is out here. Our building line of building is all the way out there with the shaded gray portion. At the sill, we have the same thing with a nice canted sill piece down here made to look like stone. So we would have our cement plaster down here as stone. We would have our cement plaster up here as cement plaster because this building is sort of a deco style building. Um, but the interesting part is again, our insulated stud walls are far behind the window. And what we are able to create with that window is a backlit box upon which we have LED strips. We have a layer of a diffusion material. We have an optional curtain that can be drawn partially or fully or completely open within the box. And then all the way out here, we have an actual operable window system. We've detailed all of the insulation, which are these squiggly lines in here. You can see screw heads, which attach our different layers of studs together. We've got our studs supporting all of our sheathing. We have our waterproofing on top of that, which is just uh, a waterproofing membrane to keep the water that comes through the cement plaster out of the framing. And then we have a much larger waterproofing membrane around our box and down into the envelope system that's keeping the weather out of the building. Similarly, at the head, we've got our waterproofing will step in from outside of the wall, come all the way back behind the box, and then will complete itself. Uh, similar, you can see more of the top end of the LED panels, the diffuser, the curtain, and the window itself. So like Andy said, these windows are often operable, and by operable, it's not necessarily for, you know, air or guest comfort. It's often just to access whatever is in there as GAC. Um, the set pieces, the, you know, may do the maintenance for the lighting components, change out the curtains, add seasonal stuff for Christmas, you know, so all of that stuff needs to be protected from weather. So that's why it's weatherproof, but it also needs to be accessible. And sometimes they're accessed from the front and the front opens up. 
Sometimes we access them from the rear and we have access panels in the rear. So it really depends on where the window is, what it's adjacent to in the back and uh, what they need to do with it. Because um, with the advent of LEDs, sometimes uh, the operator, the theme park operator tells us they never need to get into it. Um, we always argue, yes, you will need to get into it, but uh, sometimes we're overruled by the owner that LEDs last forever, it'll be fine. Um, always have an access panel. Yes. Um, and then finally, uh, the last bit of detailing is, uh, as you see in this collection of string course details, cornices um, and corbels, sometimes uh, high up out of the reach of guests, we will use a glass fiber reinforced plastic, a GFRP, otherwise known as fiberglass, or when it's lower down and touchable, a GFRC, which is a glass fiber reinforced concrete um, molded piece. Uh, they're usually extrusions. And these can be detailed all the way down to, we know exactly how we attach them with screws, how they interact with the cement plaster, where we need to seal them with a backer rod <clears throat> and caulk sealant, and how um, you know, every last dimension of how these need to be fabricated so that they can be repeatable details. And then when you see the finished product, uh, right here is the window that we had been looking at in detail. And that is what a backlit show window ends up looking like. All right. I'm going to take a break and coffee is going to show you how fire life safety considerations guide the design process. Everybody's favorite part. Firewalls. No, you sold just it. Me. Oh, you sold just, it. Coffee. Just, just me. All right, fine. Um, ride and fire life safety. So the thing with rides is, you know, you got to make them safe. And they're different from regular buildings because, you know, they have a lot of the same functions as regular buildings. You will have restrooms, you will have fire riser rooms, you will have, you know, offices and whatnot, break rooms. You've got a lot of standard functions that you would find in pretty much any other building type or typology. Um, but because it is an assembly occupancy and often a very high assembly occupancy, it has to be treated a little bit differently. We have a lot more two-hour separations in ride of buildings than in a standard construction. And some of those two-hour separations in some jurisdictions seem really arbitrary until you think about what actually is in it. So while you have your standard two-hour uh, separations for things like exit stairs over a certain height or size and electrical rooms over certain voltages um, with, you know, panic hardware, if it's over a particular voltage, Walter will tell me which one that is, but I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, you know, there are also other things that you need to think about. Like if it's a live show, do you have to have, you know, a deluge curtain at the proscenium stage? Are they using fire effects? If so, there's a whole bunch of other things that needs to go in with you know, how they pipe the propane or the natural gas or whatever combustion fuel they're using for that effect. How are they going to vent it? And, you know, mechanical will figure it out, but you need to give time and space for mechanical to figure it out. You can't just make a sealed box and then give it to mechanical and have that have no way for them to route their exhaust. They get really upset and then they break things uh, and then they crash into your structure and then structure gets really upset. So in order, to keep, <laughs> oh. <laughs> in order to keep everybody happy, you have to think about how many things impact every other thing in the building. Uh, and when it comes to fire life safety, where are the sprinklers gonna run? Where is your standpipe for the sprinklers? Where's your water supply? How do you get to it? How's the fire department gonna get into this building if they need to get into this building after hours? Where are the fire alarm control boxes? Where, like all of that stuff. So if we go to the next one, we're going to go just to str straight up how architecture oh. looks like. Okay, so this is a fabulous close-up of fire life safety exiting plan. 
So you can see the two dashes are your two hour rated one not walls, your one hour dashes, your one hour rated walls. The exits are marked with first the big number. That's how many people can go through the exit. And then this number is how many people we are actually sending through that exit based on the capacity of the building and the routing of people through those exits. The travel distance, there's a maximum depending on your building type. You know, when you go from the, the furthest corner of the room through sometimes an adjacent space, sometimes you're not allowed to go through an adjacent space depending on what type of room it is. Because this is wardrobe storage and has a very low occupancy as in, is in, considered an accessory space to the dressing room, you are allowed to pass through the dressing room to get to the exit. So this is not always the case. And each AHJ may have different rules about what they consider accessory space and what is not accessory space. And basically when it boils, when it boils down to health, safety, and welfare, always check with your AHJ. So Whatever the, you know, IBC is a great base code, not everybody uses it. Sometimes zoning codes will have overlays. Sometimes there are local amendments. Sometimes, you know, they haven't done a theme park before and are gonna get super picky about stuff because they've not done it any before. They wanna make sure it's safe. And so they go the opposite direction and making sure that they're really strict about where you can go and how you get people out of the building. You know, they'd much rather err on the side of caution than have a different one. So, I, coffee. What's an AHJ? Authority having jurisdiction. Just to remind you, we did explain this at the beginning of. It was even written in the words on the side, Walter. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, local codes are all different, and it's that's true in the United States. That's true overseas. Like codes are different everywhere. They have kind of, they all focus on, you know, health, safety, and welfare, but how they actually get it executed is can be really a crapshoot. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to accessibility because there's some really good examples of how that's different. Back to fire life safety. Fire compartments are a thing, also smoke compartments. This is how the building gets divided up into essentially zones for both um, fire barriers, smoke barriers, and I guess there's a third thing, so it's more than both, uh, and uh, exhaust. So how are you gonna do, how are you gonna get smoke out of the building? Where are the people gonna go? Like, do they have an area of refuge? Sometimes there'll be what's called a horizontal exit, which I'm not gonna get into because it's a very confusing even for AHJs, but essentially it means they define the building in two parts. And if you exit one part of the building, you are magically safe in the other side of the building. We don't like to use them very much as architects unless it's like you really can't get people out of the building because and you're not getting your creation you're, between part A and part B is very arduous to create. Yeah, it's like a three hour, four hour separation and there's a bunch of other tricks and fire dampers and nobody really wants to do them, but it is possible. Um, so on this particular plan, this is a basement plan uh, and basements have whole other issues when it comes to fire life safety. So in this building is divided up into three different fire and smoke compartments. Each compartment has its own way out um, you know, that you can pass from one compartment to another compartment that is allowed. So when the fire alarm goes off, they will automatically shut fire doors between the compartments, but you can still pass through if for some reason the exit stair would be blocked off on one compartment. You, still, you can still get safely to the next compartment and exit out of that compartment. But, you know, the compartments, they vent differently, uh, they act differently, um, and they're really just designed for safety. Uh, again, smoke compartments on this one. And I'm not going to get too deep into this because smoke compartments and fire compartments, it's really kind of a rabbit hole of how you do this. You can break and up a building. Very tangential to one another. You can, you can 
break up a building so many different ways and you really have to work with all of your consultants from structure because you need rated walls and those rated walls may be really super tall. So they might need additional structure. You have to work with your MEP because you know there's all sorts of exhaust requirements. There's fire alarm requirements. There are dampers and protected circuits and emergency lighting required. It, you know, Fire compartments are really important, but they're complicated to coordinate it. So. Okay, let's move on to everybody's favorite topic. It's my second favorite. Accessibility and inclusive design. Oh, second favorite? You, second you do favorite prefer fire design. to accessibility? Oh, uh, they're probably about tied, actually. Okay. They're both complicated puzzle pieces, and I just like complicated puzzle pieces. Since you so. enjoy it so much, have at it also. <laughs> accessibility. So just like any other building uh, in the United States, um, your local requirements in other countries may vary. Um, but in the United States, we have you know, the accessibility, the 88, 2010, uh, which is a law, not a code. So you know, that requires by law you to provide accessible um, means of approach, travel, and participation to people with disabilities. And what that most people think automatically wheelchairs, but the ADA also covers uh, vision impairment, hearing impairment, uh, neurological impairment. So all three of those things you need to uh, accommodate in some fashion. That means you have to have all of your pathways have to be a certain width. They have to be navigable. Their you know, doors have to be um, usable without any special tools, equipment. Usually that's why you see the levers on everything because you can open that with your elbow if you need to. You can open it with a tool if you need to. Your service dog might be able to open it depending on how your service dog is trained. So it, it's these laws are designed to make um, everything more accessible and inclusive for um, people with disabilities so that they can actually enjoy the ride, the attraction, the experience with a minimum of or no help from anybody you know, else. So things are signed. So thank you, Michael. ADA signage is important. So that tells you whether the bathroom is gonna be ADA accessible and has a proper wheelchair turnaround ground. Signs are gonna have braille on them for vision impaired folks. Um, sometimes the contrast is really bright so that you can tell what it is. Uh, stair stripes, you've seen them in buildings, the contrast stripe at two inches behind the nosing of the stair, that's because of ADA. Um, in a theater, you have to have ADA designated wheelchair accessible seating. So that means you have to leave seats out so that wheelchairs can park there. It's not just one wheelchair, you have to be able to park more than one wheelchair and you have to have companion seats next to them. You can't put them back in a corner or, you know, with some place that has terrible sight lines. Their experience has to be on par with the best seats or close to the best seats in the house. They have to feel like they are going to have a similar experience to most of the audience. When we go to bathrooms, I think bathrooms are next. Yeah. Bathrooms are next. Bathrooms are next. So bathrooms. Everybody has seen the ADA stall in the restroom. Um, you may or may not have noticed the ambulatory stall next to it if it's a restroom with more than generally six, but varies by jurisdiction. Stalls will have a requirement for an ambulatory stall. That's the stall in the United States that has two grab bars, one on either side. It's a prescribed width for that stall, prescribed toilet height, um, important things like that. When you get to other countries though, bathrooms get a little tricky. So this particular project is Chinese. They have a whole different series and configuration of grab bars for toilets in China um, than they do in the United States. So their ambulatory stalls are different. Uh, their toilet grab stalls in a standard ADA stall have grab bars on both sides instead of just the back and the side that we're used to in the United States. They also have a swing bar that comes down. So 
again, you know, when you're doing theme parks or really when you're doing any sort of international work, make sure you talk to your AHJ, find out what the requirements are. And even in the United States that, you know, the authority having jurisdiction really has the last say on what they've adopted as far as code goes. Sometimes they have tougher requirements than ADA. So ADA is, is your minimum requirement and whether they have accepted the 2010 ADA or newly released the ANSI 117-2017, which works in tandem with ADA, but ANSI 117-2017 increases the size of all your ADA turnarounds and stuff. So you definitely have to make sure that you find out what code the AHJ wants to see, what, what um, amendments the AHJ has, you know, and, you know, if the owner wants to future proof against other codes and, and um, laws that are coming into play now, because like ANSI 117, 2017, isn't widely used right now. It will be adopted as part of the 2021 IBC. So, you know, if you're going to have stuff that goes into 2021 IBC and there's not a local amendment that says, hey, instead of ANSI 117, 2017, we're going to continue to use ADA 2010. Like you got a 14, like seven inches on a turnaround because it goes from 60 to 67. That can create a lot of busts in your building. So you, you have to look at who's doing what and what the ASJ requires, even for ADA. Okay. Um, let's move on because if I get started, then we'll never stop talking about accessibility. Let's force ourselves to move on here to the design phases and project delivery. Uh, in a nutshell, these projects do not develop overnight, uh, especially given the complexity of the systems and the ever involving, ever evolving input schedule uh, in a project with this many moving parts. As such, there is a process by which a project is realized from inception through occupancy. Often a project will start in a blue sky phase, which is your blank sheet of paper level of ideation and conceptualization. That idea is fleshed out into a functional party during the concept phase. Sometimes, and certain uh, practitioners have a feasibility phase in which the concepts are tested with realistic considerations, space planning, adjacencies, ride systems, layouts, et cetera. All projects always move into a schematic design phase where the design team starts to create a dimensioned building that responds to the concepts developed to date. Here, space planning, adjacencies, programmatic elements, sizes, volumes, areas are all determined. The project moves into design development after that, where massing and building elements are developed from that schematic level to a nearly final state in which the team can move into detailing. Most of the overall dimensions, heights, elevations, and massing are complete by the end of the DD phase. Also, at that time, major systems are detailed, as well as repetitive and, um, and typical detailing are established. Then in the construction document phase, the team moves into more intensive detailing of less than typical conditions in the building, as well as all of these specific conditions that require their own construction methodology. All dimensions are finalized and schedules are developed for elements like fixtures, doors, windows, and other repeated and uh, multiply deployed elements within that building. Final coordination and validation of show elements, SAE, show action equipment, gags, lighting, ride, and show systems are complete at this point as well. The project is then submitted to the AHJ for permitting. While the plan check process continues, the bid and negotiation phases will begin where the design team helps answer questions um, given by the general contractor in a pre-construction forum. 
uh, and aids in the negotiations between the general contractor and the owner. Finally, the project goes into construction. During construction administration phase, the architect will answer RFIs, which are requests for information, and review submittals. Also, um, site observations are performed and certification of uh, completion of work are issued to back up general contractor invoicing. Um, we are, coffee is going to run you through. I want to blow through this there. really, really fast. But, yeah, we're going to go really quickly through a buildup of a couple of buildings through these phases. So this is schematic. You can see it's kind of cartoony and just kind of generally says this is the shape of the building. You know, this is what it looks like in 3D. This is design development. So you can see that shape of the building is starting to a little, get a little bit more refined. We've started to identify what materials go on there. In 3D, you can see again, materials are starting to be called out. The shapes are becoming a little bit more refined. We've started to detail critical stuff. Oops. And in <laughs> he would get too fast. <laughs> and in, in CDs, um, you know, it, it's even further refined. We we've, we've sorted out all of the critical details. We know what everything is for real. Um, specifications have aligned with these documents. So we have our project manual, which is a really big book of this is what everything is. Doors are this. They have to meet these standards. Um, here's all the hardware sets that go with them. Uh, insulated panels are by one of these three manufacturers, and here's all this, all the standards that they need to meet, et cetera. Here are your directions for substitution, et cetera. So, and then this is what it looks like when it's all said and done, and the everybody is signed off. There's a CFO, contractors turned it over to the owner, and it opens. Um, you know, again, schematic design, very cartoony, sort of what it looks like, sort of what it looks like. This is design development. This is sort of what it looks like, how we make it stand up, where everything starts to go, how all of the pieces work together. Yeah, th this one, for what it's worth, has a ride system that is both inside and then exits the dome. So you start to see the actual ride path. Developing that DD phase. That big triangular thing on the left is actually a faux mountain. So that's the structure to hold up the carved character plaster that makes the mountain. So you can see in design development, you've got like a 3D shot that has also the skin, the ride track. We've started to develop, you know, the details at this point of how the mountain crashes into the EFIS and how the glass crashes into the mountain, etc. And then in construction documents, we've detailed all of that out called out all of the materials, understand what it is, um, and it worked much of it out. So you see super realistic looking mountain. We did that with a scan, so they go out there in the field and actually carve to the scan to the best of their ability. All of the glazing on this dome has a, in construction documents, had a big section, several sheets of like, this is what all the panels look like. These are all the dimensions of the panels. This is how it all goes together. And then in completion, you could see all those beautiful glass panels and the faux mountain in the background and you know, the beautiful area development that you would have seen uh, in the first segment of this series when Dan and Maro talked about area development. So yeah. if you haven't seen it, go watch it on YouTube. And then just to run through one more without so, even driving, you got your schematic elevations. That one didn't even have a model that was worth looking at its schematic design. Uh, your DD level, you can see all the development happening. Um, you know, for DD, there's a lot of this form is already figured out here in, uh, you know, in the 3D massing. And then once you get into your construction document level, uh, again, you can see all of um, the show pieces uh, all of the GAC on the roof is defined. And, you know, these things are 20s of meters in the air. So they're not only defined, but there's real structure holding that up as well, um, you know, as evidenced in the massing and the 3D. Uh, and then this one also, uh, that's what it looks like in real life. And then 
Um, let's move into uh, our means of execution here. Again, we'll just uh, touch on it briefly. And uh, we'll speak of Revit. Coffee, if you want to talk about our favorite software a little bit. We like Revit. Revit is awesome. Uh, Revit is a building information modeling software. So it, you draw walls and ceilings and various other parts in 3Ds. Um, you know, they link to other 3D models by all of your consultants. So your MEP will also be in 3D, your structures in 3D. Like you can see where it clashes, where people need to coordinate stuff. It's fantastic for just being able to visualize everything in 3D. You can take that model, you can render out of it, you can put it into a VR rig and actually like walk around with your Oculus or whatever. Um, and look at what you're drawing uh, in sort of real time. So you can see kind of gaps in detailing and where clashes with are that you can't see in a 2D plan, you can see very well in 3D. And so modeling is really strong for that level of coordination because you know before when you just had 2D artifacts, sections and plans, there's a lot of things that change directions that you don't see in plan and you don't understand how they crash into each other. This way, you know, we get to coordinate a lot of that stuff, especially when it comes to thinning things because a lot of compound curvatures, a lot of very odd shapes, uh, a lot of non-Euclidean geometry that happens that you can really understand better in 3D than you can in 2D. So, so. Then if we look at uh, what we're able to do now is through uh, another piece of software, which is called Navis Works, which is effectively a very fancy plugin for Revit. Uh, we can take a much more, uh, a lighter version. Uh, it's a little bit less detailed of our Revit model. And we can build up our different systems and actually look at them to see how they are coexisting in 3D space. And so I'm going to go through a little animation here. So the first thing you're seeing in green is the beginnings of the structural model. And as this model develops, it's going to turn to render. And then if I pause it again, you can see inside uh, in this example, we've got our fire sprinkler system, which in a building like this, especially a dome, is something very important to understand where the fire sprinklers go. And so that's going to kind of form and solidify into hardline. And now we're going to look uh, what we're seeing coming up in green is our mechanical, electrical and plumbing systems. And, you know, most notably, you can see the air handlers on the roof, but you can also start to see the duct work. Um, you know, that's inside of the dome itself and the rest of the building as it spins. And then that's going to become kind of hardened in there. And now the final skin that we see is the architectural model. And in this case, that includes the dome, the building, as well as we just represented the mountain as part of our architecture here. And so if I let that play out, you're going to end up with hot pink mountains. So let me run that one more time and I'll be quiet and you can watch it actually happen. So let's recap here. Uh, what have we covered today? We've learned what themed architecture is. We have learned about queue design. We have learned about facade design, fire life safety, accessibility and inclusive design, the design phases and project delivery. And finally, we've learned a little bit about Revit and coordination. We would love to hear any questions you may have. And I believe Walter has been collecting those for us out of the chat. Correct. So uh, first of all, 
great job guys you covered a lot of ground and a lot of material and i think that's only scratching the surface of all the things you are responsible for it doesn't even begin not even a little bit and uh i i always appreciate what you what you have to uh have to deal with and how how skillfully you manage it all because it is a lot of, of ground to cover uh, so we have a couple of questions and i know we're running long and i'm sure people are getting ready to go uh move on to other things. But real quick, uh, one question that someone asked is how COVID has affected your architectural design for theme parks. Any thoughts on that? Design in terms of designing for COVID or design in terms of how it has affected the way we work? However you'd like to interpret it. Well, uh, the easier part of that question is uh, how we work. Um, as a company at Cunningham, uh, coffee has always been based in Las Vegas. I've always been based in Los Angeles. And we've been working together on projects since 2016 as if we're sitting in the same room. So for us, uh, COVID just reinforced that we can do a work from home, work from anywhere, cross office or intra office and have no issues with it. Um, in terms of how we are designing future proofing our buildings for the next go round, um, you know, we did, we've taken a lot of, you know, entertainment did take a hit during COVID. Uh, we had some downtime, let's call it. And I think we've looked at a lot of assessing uh, spaces within queues, specifically, how do you queue socially distanced? Uh, we've done a lot of research into um you know how food service can be done slightly differently you know we've looked at more order through app and you know what does it mean for the building if you order through an app pick it up from a window and then go elsewhere to eat it uh because that has spatial implications um i know probably a question walter that you're better suited to answer but uh in terms of the HVAC systems and, you know, other, other aspects there. Um, you know, there's definitely how can we better, you know, clean the air, get better air changes, um, you know, looking at just inside air quality within buildings. Um, how can we take more of our activities and take them outside? So I think it's been a multitude of areas of research. And I truly think we're only beginning kind of, uh, how do you say it? It's like we're getting ready for the next pandemic, even though we don't ever want to have another one. Yep, absolutely. Uh, so the next question is for you, Coffee. Uh, how different or similar are Chinese fire life safety code building requirements compared to the U.S.? Not. They're they're not. They're, Get out of here. They're worse. <laughs> they're 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 entirely different, and um, it really depends on who you speak to and what jurisdiction even within China you're in. Um, the way their code is written uh, at the time when we did that, the project that um, we had up on the screen, there was no English translation of any of their code books. So we would have to rely on our local design partner to translate bits and pieces for us. And then how it gets translated, there's a lot of, well, you should do this. Uh, in US code, it's either you do or you do not, and here's a recommendation that you may or may not pick up. They couldn't give us that granularity of like, do I have to do it or is this a suggestion? So a lot of times we may have designed over their code because we could not get a succinct translation of that. That's so, or a consistent interpretation of that translation. And, you know, and that, and when they have elections and, um, you know, the, the, the local jurisdiction essentially changes over, you have to start those negotiations over again because they don't necessarily transfer from one group to another. So working in China is a, a whole different kettle of fish, um, different sorts of challenges, uh, and it's still very fun and, you know, a complex puzzle but it is very different and you do have to trust your local partner. Very well said. Uh, okay, I got one more question. It's for each of you. Uh, and I think we only have a couple more minutes. So I'd love to hear your take on this. Um, 
was your goal when you started your career to work in themed entertainment or was it something you got into uh, after you had chosen architecture? Off of you laughed first. Um, total accident. I, I, because I come from a film background uh, and did props and models, you'd think it would be kind of a no brainer, but honestly, architecture was kind of an accidental discovery for me. I was not one of the people who like at 12 decided wanted to be an architect. Like I did not know at 12 that architecture was a career that you could go into. Um, so I am a late comer to the career of architecture. Uh, and it is, um, it's super fun and it works really well, uh, mostly because I like fast paced, really complex, very large projects. Uh, and uh, that's what you get. You get fast paced, large, complex projects that pretty much change on a dime and, and you have to roll with it and uh, make it happen. And then the reward is seeing it open and knowing that you had a part to play in bringing that imaginary world to life. So you actually came in it from the entertainment side and found architecture. How about you, Andy? Uh, by contrast, I actually was one of those people at nine years old who decided I'm going to be an architect, probably before I could spell the word. Um, and I had every intention of going into high-minded, uh, form-driven design, so much so that I spent my first three years out of grad school working for none other than Frank Gehry. And for as rewarding as that was, um, it has its drawbacks. And I truly found my way into themed architecture also as a complete accident. Um, we were slow and the principal in charge said, hey, you wanna come work on something different? I had been working on multifamily residential at that moment. And I said, yeah, I'll do anything once, maybe twice, just to make sure I don't like it. Um, and that entailed driving uh, over to Glendale, California on a daily basis and um, getting to play with a whole bunch of Imagineers, a couple of which I see out in the audience here. Um, and, you know, really fell in love with it. And what I think I found the most rewarding was that where in let's call it civilian architecture you're going to do a museum or a restaurant uh here you get to work on something that has retail restaurants uh shows and theaters um attractions which you can't even necessarily define in you know colloquial architectural typologies and you get to do it all and you know what, if you don't like uh, fairy princess castles, wait till the next project, you may be doing a scary monster land. Or the next one, you may be doing a cartoon. Uh, or a whole different kind of cartoon. One's anime and one's, you know, kitty. You know, Hello Kitty, for that matter. Um, and it just really, I found that the complexity in this is even more rewarding. And I think it's harder to coordinate this than even, let's say, the, the aforementioned Frank Gehry building. So, you know, got me. Well, again, thank you both so much. Uh, I know you put a lot of time in preparation for this, and uh, I think I speak for everyone in saying thank you. And uh, with that, we'll wrap it up, and uh, we'll see you in our next series, which I think will be uh, in January, where we'll focus on the structural engineering aspects of uh, a theme park design. So I hope to see you all then and uh, have a great, great rest of your day. Take care.